I want to talk a little bit about Flash Blade, uh, but I'm not really here to spend most of the time sort of talking about it. We brought with us two of the lead developers, engineers, engineering leaders, directors in the R&D organization, and together we spent the last couple of years building this project called Flash Blade. So they're the ones who are really going to do the talk. They're going to tell you at depth how we came to this design, what's the things we believed in when we built this, and then what's the sort of trials and tribulations we went through on the journey to get to this, and then like why certain other designs were tested, but we didn't find that we could get as much value out of them as what we can get out of this design. So I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, it's really, really technical, and I hope you'll enjoy that too. Uh, I've sort of seen these videos on the before that you've done with vendors, and I found them enormously enjoyable, and hopefully we, we give us enough, enough depth to you that you'll enjoy this too. So with that, I'm gonna spend 10 minutes, actually I'm trying to make it six, but I'm sure it's gonna be 10, of doing what we did in about 40 minutes at the launch. It's a quick recap of what we've done, and I'll talk a little bit what we've done since then, and then hand it over to, to the engineers. So Flashblade is the product we built. It's a scale-out storage product. We first introduced it with a file protocol, NFS, and, and we're also gonna have an object interface to it later this year. Um, it is not a filer. We don't think of it as a filer. We think of it as a storage product that has different interface methods. And, and we think we should have many over time. And, and both Rob and Brian will kind of talk to you why we think this design allows that. Um, why did we pick this as our entry point? Well, we have a product today that sort of serves the database world fairly well, or really well, I'd say, as well as sort of the virtual machine world, VM farms. And, and that's Flash Array. There's a new world that we have identified, that we see out there, where we have quite a bit of different type of content. It, it's built around sort of scientific data, analytic data, log data, build tests, sensor data. We, we're seeing sort of backup DR object, imaging, transcoding. These are data sets that are born digital, largely. They don't originate in humans. They come from, they come from machines. And they're very, very different. They, they scale with Moore's law. They don't really scale with GDP. They, they are analyzed and connected and interacted with, with machines and that create other outputs that humans sort of interact with. And they're growing tremendously differently. In fact, we think that of these, this is becoming the commodity and this is becoming a whole new sort of set of data that's growing at a very different clip and pace and has very different requirements than we historically have had. We aimed and we designed Flashblade first for that. But we're not trying to build a product exclusive to that. This just happens to be our, our early entry point. Uh, we think that segment is somewhat underserved. We also think that object count matters. But we're observing files or objects, doesn't really matter what you call it. But if you think it's growing at a tremendous clip, at a pace that's unsurpassed, and, and coping with large amounts of metadata, coping with large amounts of files and objects, it's becoming a bigger problem than just coping with large amounts of data itself. And, and these are two dimensions of the storage problem that are related, but they're really not the same. And, and Rob and Brian will both talk to kind of how, how we had to rethink the design to cope with very large amounts of metadata pressure. Ultimately, we're trying to design a product that essentially sort of encapsulates these three values. We're trying to build something that become really big these data sets are growing exponentially. And so you need to build a system that can start small and become really, really big and really dense. It has to be fast. When you are interacting with CPU cores and, and you're running at the speed of thousands and tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds, hundreds of thousands of CPU cores, it, it needs to be really fast to serve all of these concurrently. But it also got to be really simple, simple to upgrade, simple to set up, simple to operate. You, you don't want to create uh, aggregates and RAID groups and stripes and all that stuff. You want the machine to self-balance, self-level. When you add capacity, it should be instantaneously available to you without you having to do a whole lot about it. It, sh it should just behave that way. So it needs to be simple. And we try to engineer the product in such a way. We share this at launch. I'm going to share this again, mostly as a kind of recap. And, and we, we had, a, in the initial launch, a few goals. We built two types of blades, one does eight terabyte. It's actually 8.8, .8, but we run down, uh, never run up storage. So it's eight. At full size, you multiply eight by the 15 blades, 
it, it's actually a little bit bigger than that, um, because it's 8.8. .8. We also built a 52 terabyte blade. Um, it's six times bigger. We built that because we wanted to build a really, really big blade. And, and, and we wanted to see kind of where's the trade-off between blade count and blade size. Who is emphasizing size? versus who's emphasizing performance. Who wants more CPU cores, processing IOs, per unit capacity, versus who wants more storage per CPU core. We can buy it in any one of these dimensions. And, and we'll talk a little bit more to that. We've done some testing, and these are still holding true in customer environments, and we have real customer data we're going to show you towards the end of that. So it's pretty fast. We get about a gigabyte a second throughput per blade, right? fairly linearly, from small to big. Uh, we get pretty darn good IO rates. Uh, benchmarks are always tricky. Uh, we, we use more real customer data because what we observe when you run real workloads is the same as so in flash array. When IOs complete faster, caching behavior in application tier changes. And IO mixes that we held for granted of what's, what's sort of metadata access versus data access changes. So, so, so we, we talk more about IOPS than we talk about sort of the classical benchmarks and we, we're going to share, share with you real end user environments results before and after. Uh, we, in, in a 52 terabyte blade size, fully configured, we can fit about 1.6 petabyte usable. That assumes three into one data reduction. Now you may notice that some vendors, and, and even ourselves for, for, for our existing flash rate, we generally claim a higher DDoP rate, or data reduction rate, I should say. In this world, first, we don't see a whole lot of DDoP. When you work on time data sequences, sort of a, a time and a piece of data attached to that, it's just not the whole of the duplication to be exploited. So we tend not to get that benefit and we don't see it. But what we do see is we see quite a bit of compressibility. So we reduce the data reduction rate. Uh, real world, it is about there. I mean, our, our, our early adopters, this is about where it is, about three, three and a half into one. <coughs> Curse there's some use cases when there's no data reduction. I mean, there's some data sets that just doesn't compress or, or reduce at all. Uh, for those, divide that by three, and you get to the number. Um, we built this with the new inner operating system. The data structures we use from Purity, our existing flash rate product. The CLI and end user experience are very similar. But the inside is actually very different. And, and specifically, Rob will talk quite a bit in terms of the inside. Uh, we built this with N plus two redundancy, particularly for anything that has persistency. And last point, we tried to make it not just dense, but also very energy efficient. Worst case, full load, 52 terabytes blade, 15 of them, you're running as hard as you can. 15 gig a second, 1850 watts. It, it is an amazingly energy efficient package. And, and, and we think that is something that people really would really appreciate. Not just space efficiency, but energy efficiency. So, kind of recapping, um, we think you know, these really big and really fast data sets are becoming sort of the center of innovation. You look at sort of machine learning, you look at these new ways of interacting with data, it, it's emerging in general industries, but it's becoming really, really big. And, and we think science and media is born digital, becoming more and more born digital. Uh, you're looking at analytics, I mean, we do this in our call home systems. Every 30 seconds we get data. We analyze it and we predict, is the customer having a system that's in a good shape or do we need to open up a service ticket and, and repair or, or otherwise talk to the customer about how the system performs. We do that automatically, it's real-time analytics. Everyone starts to do this now. Even car companies are now sending data back on how every time you hit the brakes, every sensor in the car, so they can predict how it operates. And, and, and this is just the world we're in. Car, you, you, you speak to airplane manufacturers. They do this around airplanes, predicting lifespans, making sure that they run the system in operating environments that sort of optimizes for, for the, the usage. And finally, there's new types of development frameworks. There's new types of ways we create new applications and, and also hardware systems. For these new frameworks, for these new applications, you have to interact with data very differently. Continuous integration, continuous development, it's, it's, a, it's a very different way of, of building systems than the way we used to. It also changes who you com converse with. Right? In this world, you talk to scientists, creatives, producers. 
In this world, you're speaking to data scientists, and in this world, you're speaking to developers. It's, it's a very different interaction versus sort of, hey, I'm going to move a database that we had for 20 years onto a new platform. Right? So, so we are building a system for new use cases. Of course, we, over time, want to make sure they work with things that already exist. But we're building it for really new use cases as well as new customers. So I want to talk a little bit to our beta because since you heard about this system, we've been busy out there installing. And, and we've been installing it into a couple of industries. And I kind of want to summarize them into three categories. Um, rich media, data analytics, and technical, compu technical computing. And within these categories, you can kind of see subcategories. And, and within every single one of these categories, we have a couple of installations. Um, and you have the movies, the studios, and the special effects houses. All right, I mean, imagine you're shooting a, a movie. And, I'm going to make one up. Uh, the, mo the, the one that I enjoyed the best that was heavily animated was obviously Avatar. And I'm a sci-fi guy, what can I say? <laughs> and, 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 and these are the types of systems that, that uh, these are the types of, of movies that are dependent heavily on computing infrastructure and storage, underlying storage infrastructure in order to create that content. This is becoming, you know, everywhere. Animation, children's uh, broadcasting across the board. We're seeing even real time, you know, we're doing special effects as it relates to sports. Um, universities broadcasting, and that kind of goes into here. Broadcasting lectures, um, just doing regular studio broadcasting. Gaming, gaming is becoming a massively parallel. It all connects to central instance. We do replays of the games. We play them back for here on YouTube and so forth. Gaming is coming big. Transcoding is real time there. And of course, user images, you know, you, you, we were public. Shutterfly has been using our system for about a year. Um, they're, they're an uploader of photography, essentially, for consumers. But other types <coughs> of imaging, diagnostic imaging for medical, there's financial images where, you know, signatures and other things has to be recorded for regulatory reasons. And we're involved in. Analytics, I uh, talked a little bit sort of what we're doing, and we, we have a couple of other uh, consumer of analytics using us for that. Simulation of natural resources. Uh, genomics. Genomics turned out to be bigger than I thought. The fact is, I didn't know a whole lot about genomics myself. I, I thought it was sort of human genome. Uh, since we launched, with the next few days, we got lots and lots of phone calls, unsolicited, from genomics companies who were basically saying, hey, we saw this on the news. We read the blogs. In fact, I think many of you guys wrote, wrote some things of it. It says, we'd like to learn more. And since then, we've been installed in a bunch of things. And it's not the genomics I anticipated. It's uh, plant genomics. Checking two fields that have plants <laughs> next to each other. See how they cross pollute. See how they cross breed and see what happens. Because the yields for the farm wasn't great. It's all over the world. And what's, what's specific about their data types? Are they just storing lots of unstructured data? They just collect... You can't call it unstructured because the, the, way you, the way you do a genome, you basically, you basically grind it. So I have studied this now. So you grind it down, and then you send either light or electricity to it, and you measure how much passes through. Right. And based on that, you kind of figure out what the genome pairs are, and then you're searching for patterns. Right? And oh. the data sets are huge right. Okay. Right? because you have to have enough genomic material to make sure that you can do that. So it's analysis of... of, of it's like log analysis, yeah. except... This, these are sort of data sets that have, they have both structure, but they're so large that you can't sort of find the structure easily. Right. All right. It's, 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 and it's not quite HPC either, although in many ways it has some similarities to it. It has similarities with log analytics. It's analytics. And of course, financial modeling. Taking ticket data, taking trading positions, and creating synthesis to figure out what's the exposure, what's our risk exposure, what's our regulatory exposure. And then the classical stuff, right? Technical computing. Software developers, continuous integration, continuous development. Uh, we're actually going to show you some real-world examples from that. Electronic design automation, the stuff you typically read about in the press when people design a new chip and they run hundreds of thousands of cores to simulate, is it correct? And the more you can automate that, the faster you can run. Uh, a typical tidbit that you hear from the industry, it takes a year to design a chip, it takes four years to validate it. Uh, if you can shave off 20%, you're amazingly beneficial. The data sets are huge, tens of thousands, of course. There's another subject that I actually didn't anticipate was as widespread as it is. Uh, machine learning turns out to be far more prevalent than I thought, and in far more places in industries I didn't anticipate, where they basically 
gather enough data sets, have a hypothesis, train the machine to predict outcomes. You hear it often about this in places like search engines, uh, I can't name companies by name, and how they predict the outcome from a search instantaneously in the search bar. But quite frankly, self-driving cars are behaving this way as well. You teach the car how to drive. You teach the car what a stop sign looks like. And, and similar types of use cases. It, it's becoming very prevalent, and we installed a couple of those. And then, of course, the simulation compute forms, we're simulating other types of structures. So here's where we are today. We picked these workloads because they're hard. If you can cope with these workloads, you can cope with anything. It, it makes sort of the, the, the database VM workload easier because these are the hardest of the hardest in our industry. But they're not your classical supercomputing. We're not going to the national labs that's really one-offs. So that's the truly exotic stuff. This is, this is commercial, and it's widespread, it, and it's every industry. Did you, did you go out and do any research on the size of the, what you think the industry size is in terms of potential revenue and market share? Uh, we did. I mean, it's big. Um, but I'm hesitant to share it because, you know, I can't independently validate it. Okay, uh, it shows be aware of this is our first use case. We expect to use this as a launch pad for other things. So, but I want to highlight this to you because it is big. It might feel niche, but it creates a really wonderful launch pad for other things you want to do. So much of these, uh, you know, the technical computing guys have gone to more of a, you know, compute and storage in the same server kind of Hadoop kind of world. And how do you find this sort of solution, which is kind of a separate storage solution to that environment? Does it work well in that? I think you'll find that that is actually facing out a little bit. There's a reason why they didn't go to technical, I believe, they didn't go to a technical architecture where they closed the couple, the CPU and the storage. What they went to is they went to an architecture where the software was closed a couple to the storage. They can implement their own software layer because they were displeased with the storage subsystems that existed. So they wrote their own. And the easiest way to wrote your own is to have the storage close to where the application run. But if you create a wonderful storage layer, they have no longer the, the need to write their own. And there are some benefits you get from sharing, particularly if you're trying to split up a problem in small pieces, scaling out to computers that are loosely coupled and, and, and sort of have them coordinate with each other through that storage layer. I think it's just that much easier. And, but there's just nothing out there that allowed them to do that effectively. And that's why they started implementing storage functions in the application directly. I think if you if you think I think of that as boutique storage, it's boutique on a per application basis. And as long as the application is big enough, it might be worthwhile. But if you have something more efficient, it's not. Mm. And then that that's what we're seeing. All right, let me. Uh, so in fact, some of these guys are are testing us to abandon what they had to build themselves because they could find nothing else. So I'm almost done and. I am a little bit late. I said 10 minutes. I'm at 17. So my apologies. I have to speak faster. <laughs> uh, last questions. Here's what we heard, or, or as a team, that we hope to answer today. This is what we heard in the blogs. I tried to synthesize into like three questions. Why did you build your own hardware? Isn't that so 1990s? So we should tell you why, <laughs> right? It is, it is 1990s, and it's in vogue again. And we should tell you why. Why did you just put the gateway in front of flash array like almost everyone else seems to be doing? Well, we have some real good reasons why not. I'm going to tell you why as well. And finally, hasn't scale out IP search been solved already? And what's better? And that is actually the really big question. That's the one that Rob and Brian is going to tackle.